And uh, next up, we will have uh, Dirk van der Born from Uniper Network. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Um, let me see if this works. Yeah, all good. Good. So yeah, um, I'm between you and lunch, so I'll uh, I'll try to make it. Uh, Interesting uh, for, for the remaining time. Um, so I'm Dirk van der Borne from Juniper Networks. I, uh, I run part of our specialist organization, and I have a few years of background in optics. So I'm, I'll try to, uh, to, to show some interesting developments, a little bit future-oriented. So I purposely, I'm not going to talk too much about what is there today, but I'm going to talk more about uh, where things are going. Uh, I hope it's interesting. Um, thanks also to, uh, to N-Logic uh, for, for this, the, the speaking slot. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, without further ado, let's, let's get started. Um, and when, when, I, when I talk about the trends in, in the industry around uh, optical interfaces, about Ethernet that's doing, I, I always like to, to start with an, uh, a version of this, this plot. This is uh, from light counting. So it's, an, uh, it's a market analyst, and they, they are very well connected in the industry. They have a good view on things. Um, and this, uh, this shows you how, over a very long period of time, the industry is evolving in terms of Ethernet speeds and feeds. Um, and of course, I mean, no surprise to anybody, right? On the, the lower end, things are, you know, the heydays are over. It's a long tail, but, uh, but lower speeds are less and less used. They are pushed toward the edge of the network. One gig, 10 gig. Um, that is not really being replaced by things like 25 gig Ethernet. Those. Uh, they're used a little bit in the, in the RAN network, the edge completely. But mostly what, what you see in the industry is that we're moving from 10 gig to 100 gig Ethernet. And that's been ongoing, of course, for over a decade now. Um, when you see here, I have here 100 gig mature in, 2000, in 2017. Mature in this definition here means it ships about a million ports in the industry. Um, you only get there if the data centers deploy this, right? I mean, for all the nice things that service providers around the world do, enterprises do, you don't add up to that number of ports unless it's, it's really, really very big technology. So when it says here mature, that's typically the, the, the point in time when the data center starts to deploy it. And that happened for Hanekik in 2017 with the basically QSP28 becoming a mature form factor. And over the last few years, this has grown tremendously. Um, we're shipping now 10, 15 million ports a year as an industry, 100 gig Ethernet, and that is, of course, growing uh, significantly in the years ahead. Um, of course, that technology is changing over that time, right? I mean, the 100 gig Ethernet that we were deploying 10 years ago is very different from what we're deploying now, and even that is evolving going forward. I mean, for example, in the context of what mo a lot of you will deal with today is the move from 100 gig LR4 optical interfaces to 100 gig LR1 optical interface, right? This is something that's happening in the industry, where which, which is something you will see when you interconnect with other networks, uh, where you have to change things to, to keep up with the speeds and feeds on modern platforms, uh, and that's sometimes creating headaches. Um, but good, as promised, the focus here is a little bit on what's going more towards the future. So, so where are we on the higher speeds? Now, 400 gig Ethernet is something that we can call mature today. Right? Uh, it's been, of course, under development for the last few years. But by 2021, so one, two years ago now, we can really say this is now being deployed at large scale in data centers. So this, this one million units shipped in the industry, we got there. It's really mature technology. And of course, from here on, we're growing further to, to more than 10 million ports over the next few years. From there on, where are we going? So at the moment, we see that across the industry, we're moving from 400 gig Ethernet to 800 gig Ethernet. We're still in the very early stages there, right? You will see now the very initial deployments in data centers are starting. AI clusters have been using it for a year or so, right? That's, that's at the moment, the very first adopters from the highest speeds and feeds at the moment are the AI clusters, no longer the data centers. They've started to use it. Data centers will now start to adopt it. We see the first routing platforms in the industry, but it's slowly but surely starting. Maturity of this technology we'll see next year, roughly. And again, that's mostly then really the data centers starting to deploy it. And from there on, of course, we'll grow. And at the moment, and this is a little bit of a crystal ball, of course, 2026, 2027, we will see the larger scale adoption of uh, 1.6 terabit Ethernet. Um, given how the industry is, is changing very rapidly at the moment, right? you might have heard about this thing called ChatGDP. Uh, this is 
probably largely uh, deployments and adoption in AI clusters. Uh, I was last week at the OOC in San Diego, and that was the talk of the town there. Uh, there is something uh, like the optics needed to build AI clusters is a huge topic in the industry at the moment, and there is a lot of money going in that direction. And of course, if there's money, that will, that will create new technology, create new applications, right? Good. So as I mentioned, from 400 gig to 800 gig. Now, of course, optics is one thing. You also need the systems. And this mainly comes down to the packet forwarding engines that are currently being built. Now, there are a variety of, uh, uh, of packet forwarding engines in the industry. Broadcom, for example, builds a lot of the high-end uh, packet forwarding engines that go in the switching platforms. Here I give you one example from, from Juniper. And this is our, our PTX series, where we build uh, the highest capacity port forwarding engines for our portfolio. And what is happening across the industry, and of course we are doing that as Juniper, but it's happening across the industry, we're moving from 50 gig to 100 gig electrical I.O. That, that is the, the key technology trend in the next generation of platforms. Um, and if you see the, the, the capacity of the, uh, the, the chips you build these days, it's always a, it's a combination of the number of services that you build, or build on chip, the baud rate, as well as, of course, the modulation format, so the number of symbols uh, per, per bit. Now, for, for services, that is PAM4 modulation, so four-level pulse amplitude modulation for the 400 gig generation, now also for the 800 gig generation. And as things stands now, that will also likely stay for the 1.6 terabit uh, generation. So it's 2 times 50. This is where the 100 gigabit electrical I.O. comes from. And then the number of services is increasing over time because we... Yeah, it, it's, it's a good way to build bigger and higher capacity ASICs by just going to more service interfaces. So that allows you to really build a next generation of very, very high capacity packet forwarding engines on routers, on switches. Again, this is an example from Juniper, but it's happening across the industry. So what do we do then on the optical interface side? Now, we have the packet forwarding engine, and in the, the prior generation, the 400 gig generation, sounds kind of maybe all to some of you, right? referring to the prior generation as 400 gig, but in this context, we are looking at it like this. Uh, you would have 8 times 50 gig PAM4 electrical I.O. as the interface from the packet forwarding engine towards the optics. And generally, this would have been a 400 gig QZP DD optic. Within the optic, you would convert from 8 times 50 gig PAM4 electrical to 4 times 100 gig PAM4 optical interfaces. So there's a gearbox in there. Um, it's easier to build higher speeds in the optical domain, optical I.O., than it is to build those in the electrical domain. It's just the way things are, right? High speed electrical traces are really difficult. The longer they are, the more difficult it gets, but they are really expensive and difficult to build. On the optical side, things are easier. Optical is a great transmission channel, right? Greatest transmission medium ever invented. Uh, so it's easier to build high speed optical relative to electrical. Now, when we move to 800 gig systems and 800 gig optics, we, we change to 100 gig on both ends, so both for the electrical I.O. as well as the optical I.O. So the service interfaces on the packet forwarding engines are moving from 50 gig PAM4 to 100 gig PAM4. On the optical side, we initially will stay, oh sorry, on the optical side, yes, we will initially stay with 100 gig optical I.O. So there's no change there, no gearbox function anymore, no translation in speed. Which is one of the reasons why the adoption Going from 400 gig to 800 gig is a very easy one. Right? There is backwards compatibility on a lot of the optics you would now deploy for 400 gig in this 800 gig generation, which makes it much easier and much quicker to, uh, to deploy and adopt those platforms. So, in summary, we moved to 100 gig 30s. Uh, we built much bigger PVs because we go to more services. And most of this is going to be used for breakout applications because that it readily interconnects with the 100 gig optics and the 400 gig optics that you will already have been deploying for the last few years if you have been adopting 400 gig interfaces. Right? And based on uh, just a single PV, you can then have up to 72 times 400 gig Ethernet or 20, 288 times 100 gig Ethernet interfaces from just a single chip. So it's, it's very high capacity, very, very scalable. Now, one of the key things that's happening at the moment in the systems we're building is, is how do you build for systems that are inherently limited by power consumption? Because everything we do, everything we design these days, is, is geared towards power consumption. Of course, because we want to minimize power consumption, right? Uh, generally, as the, the broader society trends, but, but even more important, because everything is limited in the power footprint. And how do you cool the, uh, the heat coming from 
high-density latest generation platforms. And optics are a very key part of it. And of course, there's an evolution, right? The initial generation of 4 gig optics, let's go back here to uh, yeah, 2020, 2021, right? These would generally be built with 16 nanometer DSPs. So there's always a DSP in the optic, right? And the DSP is generating a lot of the power consumption. Typically, 16 nanometer DSP and first generation 4 gig optics. First generation 4 gig optics means here typically EML based transmitters. This is good technology, very good uh, signal quality, but it's a little bit more complex, a little bit more higher power consumption. Those optics typically had a uh, 10 to 12 watt uh, power consumption. We're talking here about the 100 gig DR4, FR4, LR4 type in, sorry, 400 gig DR4, FR4, LR4 optics, right? The mainstream optics being deployed in the industry. Now, over the last two, three years, this is changing, we're becoming more optimized. We're moving to next generation DSPs, typically adopting 7 nanometer CMOS. We're also moving more from EML based transmitters to silicon photonics based transmitters. It's just a little bit more optimized. Also, the DSP gets better. Uh, and this allows us to bring down the power consumption of 400 gig optics more from the 10 to 12 watt range to 8 to 10 watts. That's where we are roughly today. And then now, in the next step, we're moving to 800 gig optics. And of course, you could also build 400 gig optics with that same technology, right? Generally moving from 7 to 5 nanometer DSP. Uh, and because we move now to 100 gig electrical, you, don't know, you do no longer need a gearbox. And all of that also helps to reduce power consumption. And we get down to about 16 to 18 watts for an 800 gig optic. Now divide by 2 and you can uh, compare to the, the 400 gig values that I used before. So again, we're going a little bit lower in power consumption. And once it's really using 5 nanometer DSPs, which are not shipping in the industry yet, but will be shipping by next year, uh, we're talking about around 14 to 16 watts of power consumption for uh, 800 gig optic. So it's actually very, very successful, right? I mean, we're roughly, I mean, it's a little bit more, but roughly we will have 800 gig optics at around about the power consumption of the 400 gig optics or three or four years ago. So in that sense, again, it's going to be a relatively easy step to adopt uh, 800 gig optics and 800 gig systems. So what kind of optics will we see? And this is where it probably gets most interesting for, for most of you. It is a little bit limited what kind of optics in the 800 gig generation we can build. Now, there's going to be some uh, multi-mode optics. Uh, this is actually, there's a lot of development there in 100 gig Vixel technology. So the, the, the transmitters used for multi-mode optics are called Vixels, right? It's the same stuff that's on your iPhone uh, for the 3D sensors, uh, but then a little bit better optimized. Um, and that is that's actually quite amazing. 100 gig of Vixel direct modulated uh, lasers with, with Vixel technology that we get there to, to 100 gig is really an amazing feat in technology. And that is that is starting to, to get there. Uh, looking back again at the OFC last year, last week, sorry, you will see the first uh, demonstrations there of this type of technology. So 800 gig SR8 optics, 800 gig SR4.2 optics. Not shipping yet, but it's definitely coming there. What is there today are again the 800 gig optics that are based on 8 times 100 gig electrical I/O uh, and 8 times 100 gig optical I/O, and that you can use for breakout. So DR8, XDR8. Uh, parallel LR4, LR8. These names are a little bit confusing sometimes. XDR8, uh, parallel LR8. Uh, they're also referred to as DR, sorry, DR8 plus, DR8 plus plus. It means the parallel optics. So with an MPO connector, four par eight parallel fibers, and you can use them for breakout and over different distances, right? DR8 is 500 meters. DR8 plus or XDR8 is two kilometers, and then parallel LR8 or DR plus plus is typically 10 kilometers. So those type of optics are shipping in the industry, uh, mostly for the 500 meters and 2 kilometer distance. It is what's mostly used in data centers, right? What you would typically deploy in a data center architecture. You can, of course, also deploy it in IXP type architecture. Um, but it's a little bit limited what you can do with this in more of a traditional SP environment. Now, there are also two ever four optics in the industry, right? So again, 2 kilometers now for... 4 gig ever 4 duplex SMF, but 2 ever 4, so 2 times duplex SMF, and I break out to 2 times 4 gig ever 4 on the other end. Uh, and in the same way, you can build 2 LR4 optics. Those are there a little bit in kind of maybe sampling stage, but not really. 
Um, but but they will be coming. The technology building blocks exist, so it's more uh, more a question of market demand than any fundamental challenges. Now, what, what you don't see on this slide, and what I'll now dig down into a little bit more, is there are no 800 gig duplex SMF optics, right? The equivalent of a 100 gig LF4 or a 400 gig LF4 that we all, in a, at least in the SP context, are heavily deploying and are, is the most popular optic uh, to use. So why is that? And the problem is that it's really difficult to build, and we're getting here into a little bit of, an, of a physics lesson. Uh, if you would build, so if you would scale from 400 gig LF4, just with, which uses four times 100 gig optical I.O. to eight times 100 gig optical I.O., and you use those eight wave lengths on the same fiber, then you get an 800 gig LR8. Uh, and you can do this with different wavelength grids, right? The spacing between the different wavelengths, the different optical channels. And there are basically two options. It's a CWM grid, which is 20 nanometers between each channel, or what's called a LAN WM grid, which is the same thing that's used for 100 gig LF4 and has a much tighter spacing between the channels. And both now turn out to have problems. An A-channel CWM grid is too wide with A-channels. And you run into chromatic dispersion penalties. The chromatic dispersion tolerance of an 100 gig pen 4 signal is fairly low. And with A-channels on the CWM grid, it gets too wide. You can't do it. You can't get over 10 kilometers. Um, on the other side, a LAN WM grid is, is, much, is much, much closer together with, with eight channels. So you don't really, I mean, it's not simple from a chromatic dispersion tolerance perspective, but it, you don't, it's not a blocker. The problem now is it turns out that if you have those eight channels so close to each other, you get uh, four wave mixing penalties. It's maybe a little bit trivial. Uh, um, sorry, maybe a little bit non-trivial non because it's, it's, a v it's a just a 10 kilometer range, right? Why would you run into nonlinear penalties? But the relatively high transmitter output powers that you use with client optics, at least the maximum levels as they are specified in, in the standards, really create, uh, can create very severe penalties around the zero dispersion wavelength. And, and of course, these optics always operate around the zero dispersion wavelength. And the other problem is that this, is, this has to be used on fiber that has been deployed for the last 10, 20, 30 years with very different specifications. Right? The zero dispersion wavelength can be in different wavelengths depending on when this fiber was built, by which manufacturer, and in which batch. And you have no idea, you don't know what fiber is out there because it's been deployed for decades now. Which makes it really difficult uh, to, to build these optics and be sure that it always will work. Summary of this is, we don't trust it as an industry, nobody's building this. So instead, the industry will wait and will build 800 gig LF4 optics to solve this problem, which is based on 200 gig optical I.O. So we now move from eight wavelengths to four wavelengths, and we use 200 gig PAM4 modulation at 100 gigabaud per wavelength. And this is really, really very advanced, right? It needs, again, a doubling in the baud rate, so a doubling in the frequency bandwidth, of all the optical uh, and electrical components. But we're getting there as an industry. If you look where the industry is today, 200 gig EML technology, driver technology, TIAs, photodiodes, all of that has been successfully demonstrated. And it's now starting to, to all come together and you can build these optics. That still isn't easy, right? 200 gig PAM4 modulation has a very tight chromatic dispersion tolerance because we're again doubling the baud rate. So the chromatic dispersion tolerance goes down with about a factor of four scales quadratically. Uh, so you need to do very careful chirp management. You need a much higher forward error correction, much stronger forward error correction code in order to be able to get this over one or two kilometers for sure, maybe 10 kilometers. That's the hope. Uh, probably it will end up working out, but still the proof is in the pudding. These optics are not there yet. Uh, and this is also one of the, the, the heaviest debates at the moment in the, the IEEE standardization, right? The IEEE is currently going through 800 gig Ethernet and 1.6 terabit standardization. And at the moment, one of the big things that they're working on is 200 gig optical I.O. And particularly the, the equalization and forward air correction that's needed inside the modules for the optical standards. Because we now go to, uh, to, to the architectures that are so complex, we ca can no longer have the forward air correction just in the host, right? Up to now, we've been using forward air correction on Ethernet interfaces for about 10 years. But the forward air correction was always in the host, on the PV ASICs, in the switching and routing platforms. That no longer works. It becomes, yeah, it's, it's too complicated. So you need the forward air correction in the host, and you need it on the optical modules. 
So the left option here is uh, it's a little bit small to see, but the left option here is the one we've been always using for the last 10 years. And now we go to either one of those two models, either a concatenated VEX scheme or a segmented VEX scheme. The difference between both means uh, is if the, uh, the host FEC is regenerated in the optics or, or terminated, one of both, and, or, and a new one is added, or if just the two VEX are simply uh, segmented, so they're put on top of each other. Uh, currently, the, the current leading proposal in the IEEE specification in the I802.3BJ project uh, is to use the, uh, the KP4 fact in the host as the outer code and a more complex inner code based on an, on an Hamming code. That gives you a uh, prefect forward error correction threshold of about 5e minus 3. Now, if you know a little bit about this, right, and you know what kind of how strong forward error correction codes were. Uh, used over time and how it has evolved for, for long-haul WM interfaces, this is a, at about the same complexity in forward error correction as were used uh, on WM interfaces up to about 10 years ago. So it's really changing quite quickly. Um, this is not set yet. This is just the current state of standardization in the RGPLE. Um, if you love to follow politics and you love global politics, go watch the RGPLE standardization. It's a great example of worldwide politics. It's quite amazing. Um, and more details, uh, ask me afterwards. So, assuming this will work out, what kind of optics will we have for 800 gig Ethernet and 1.6 terabit uh, Ethernet, right? And these, these two kind of come together because at the moment the assumption is that based on 200 gig optical I.O., we will have four lane optics for 800 gig and eight lane optics for 1.6 terabit Ethernet. Um, so we can, of course, build the parallel optics, DR4, XDR4, that will go over 500 meters to, be, uh, to 2 kilometers. We will be able to build EVR4 optics, so 800 gig EVR4 optics, with four wavelengths going over 2 kilometers. And quite likely, we will be able to build 800 gig LR4 optics. Again, four wavelengths going over, uh, over up to 10 kilometers with 200 gig PAM4 modulation. In the 1.6 terabit ge generation, same thing. DR8, XDR8 for parallel single mode fiber, uh, two ever four with uh, two times 800 gig ever four, and maybe a 1.6 terabit ever eight. And again, that we get, then we get back into a little bit the same problems. Uh, maybe it will work, maybe not. It's really too early to tell. At the moment, we're getting to the point where the industry is able to demonstrate. 1.6 terabit optical pluggables, of course, the, the parallel kind for now. So again, last week at the OFC, there were the first live demonstrations of actually an OSFP module with 1.6 terabit working uh, completely end-to-end -end on a link. So that's where it is at the moment before all of this is clarified and all these different variants of optics are available for at least two, three years uh, further. And then, if we look at what are the form factors, and I know you've already seen a version of this picture in the presentation uh, from yesterday, right? This is a heated debate at the moment in the industry. Are we sticking with QZPDD? Will we move to OSFP? Will we maybe move to OSFP XD? Um, in the end, it all comes down to what is the power consumption of these optics and in which form factor can we effectively cool it, right? Ultimately, the form factor really doesn't matter so much as long as we can effectively cool it on a system level. Uh, of course, it, it, in the end, right, the net end game, it will always get more attractive uh, to have a wider electrical I.O., uh, so more ele electrical I.O. channels. So moving to an uh, OSFP XD type form factor with 16 parallel electrical I.O. is going to be, in the end, more attractive. Uh, will that happen in a 100 gig electrical I.O. generation, so that we can 16 times 100 gig electrical I.O.? Half yeah, a year ago, probably the answer would have been yes. Now there's a lot of progress on 200 gig electrical I.O., so maybe we'll stick with QSPDD or OSFP. In a 3.2 terabit generation, if we're even further looking into the future, it will very likely have to be a 16-lane uh, electrical I.O. bus because there is no real other way getting to 3.2 terabits on an optical pluggable. But then again, by that time, maybe we will be using uh, CPO or MPO optics. So we'll put the optics maybe on the line card. Who knows, right? That's at least five years or more away. So there was a little bit on the, uh, on the, on the client optics. Now let's shift the uh, conversation a little bit to what's happening beyond that point for the little bit longer distances. Because as you saw already from the last few slides, it's getting harder and harder to build the traditional direct detect client optics. 
right? Of course, in, in previous generations, it's always challenging to build a 40 kilometer or 80 kilometer optic. Um, now it's getting uh, uh, harder to even build 10 kilometer optics. Maybe in a 1.6 terabit generation, we're even challenged to have a two kilometer optic. So what are we doing then? And the alternative really here is to move to coherent optics, right? Coherent interfaces. Today being used for coherent WDM interfaces. In coming generations, also normal coherent interfaces with, with fixed lasers going into campus applications, going into interdata center applications. So with the higher and higher data rate of the pluggables that we're building, the more and more we will be shifting from direct detect optics to coherent detect optics. And there is, you see here in the middle, a transition phase. This is a relatively wide transition phase, right? It, it, this is, it can, there can be one, two, even generations even, where for a given reach, you can do both. And it might be, a, either one of them might be attractive depending on your network, depending on your use cases. It's not black and white. There's a large gray zone here. But ultimately, going to higher and higher speeds, uh, it definitely will get more interesting. Now, at the moment, the, the current application and what is really revolutionizing the industry are the ZR, ZR Plus optics that are currently available in the industry, right? And that now everybody starts to build. It's, again, last week, an OVC conference. Everybody has to show this on their, their stands, that they have ZR, ZR Plus optics, or that they are planning to do that. So being from Juniper, I also have to, to do that, right? This is a Juniper ZR, ZR Plus optic. If you have never seen them and you want to hold them in your hand, find me after the talk. They actually do exist. Uh, but yeah, it's the same thing as you see here on the picture. Um, when I talk a little bit on this, I, I like to use this quote from, uh, it's from, from Jacques Picard, the oceanographer. You might have seen some documentaries from him over, over time. Um, I think it, it very much fits here. So innovation does not entail having new IDs. Um, IP optical integration is not a new ID. It's been around for 20 plus years, much longer than I've been in this industry. It's absolutely not new. But the important thing here is really getting rid of some of the old beliefs, right? And the old beliefs being here that it's difficult. We, we have folks that are working on IP, folks that are working on transport, and they can't talk to each other digitally, right? Not on a human level, not on a technology level. Yes, some of that was true in the past. But if we want to build the future networks, the next generation networks, we want to build the most optimum networks, I think we have to, to get across those old beliefs and, and really uh, work towards more, op more integration between the IP and the optical layers. And what's now happening on the ZR, ZR Plus optics is really enabling this. It's a huge change in the industry. Um, this is a very high level slide. I'll, I'll very quickly go over it, but the idea here is twofold, right? And it's important to recognize it's twofold. We're, the idea is to move the colored WDM interfaces from separate transponder cards, so separate cards that are based on the same, uh, same chassis as a Rodum or amplifier equipment, uh, and move that into the routing and switching equipment, right? Today, we would be interconnecting with gray client interfaces, but those are omitted, and we move the coherent WDM uh, interfaces directly into the router. That's one. The other thing, and this is probably even more important, is that we need to move from separate optical management and separate IP management to a combined, unified IP optical management. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a single person managing both layers of network, as I indicated in this picture, but some shape or form of that where it's much closer aligned with each other. Um, and this has been a long time coming, right? It's been a long road. I mean, we initially started with very early prototypes of ACO, or sorry, not prototypes, proprietary ACO and DCO pluggables. So the hardware existed, but there was no interoperability. There were no many vendors building this uh, that could interop with each other. And then with the start of the development of the 400 gig generation, this has been uh, starting to, yeah, been dis discussed in the industry. Um, in 2016, the OEF started with the Fornet work on the Fornet ZR implementation agreement. And subsequently, this always takes a few years. And then by 2020, right, when the world shut down because of COVID, the industry heated up in terms of IP optical integration. So the OEF finished its work on the Fornet ZR IA and published this specification. The first pluggables uh, emerged in the industry that were uh, compatible to 400 ZR, and uh, the OpenZR Plus specification was published. And OpenZR Plus is really the specification that allows us to use this technology, not only in DCI, but also metro, regional, and even long-haul networks. 
And at the same time, the OEF, of course, started already working on a next generation of technology, so the 800 gig generation of coherent doubly unpluggables. Uh, 800 GR, 800 LR, and other derivatives of that uh, that will be uh, pushed by, by different uh, standardization groups in the industry. And where we are now, 2023, there is a very healthy ecosystem of 400 gig coherent pluggable optics. In many, many cases, compliant to the 400 GR and OpenZR standards, but there are, of course, also still proprietary 400 gig uh, coherent WM optics that address sp specific use cases or address a higher optical performance. Uh, it is uh, a very wide range of technology uh, options that is out there. And it looks like to be a super healthy ecosystem, at least from the end user uh, or system vendor perspective. If I was a pluggable optics uh, manufacturer, I would get very worried that I have 20, 25 companies competing with me in the same space. Uh, there's going to be some, some sacrifices there. Um, also, there is, of course, further uh, change, further optimization of this technology. So uh, last year, for example, we have seen the first zero dBm optics coming to market. This means higher transmitter output power. These are the optics that you can readily uh, connect to an existing brownfield rhodium deployment. And also the OEF and OpenCR Plus specification have been amended to properly support 75 gigahertz grids. So going to denser grids, higher spectral efficiency, higher capacity on the same fiber. And by, uh, by somewhere end of this year, we're expecting the OEF to release the 800ZR implementation agreement. So have that officially ratified and signed off. 800LR is a little bit delayed. There's a lot of discussion again on this one. Might push into early 2024, but the main technical choices have been made. And then by somewhere early 2024, we expect to see the first 800CR pluggables uh, in, uh, in coming to the industry and hopefully into also our systems. Um, so then a little bit of data to show you why we think that this is so, so very important, why it's really changing things in the industry. And the best, the best way to always talk about it is to, to show that it's saving money, right? Because ultimately, that makes things happening, right? When, when, when changing things, when changing architectures, when adopting new technology allows you to build something more cost-effectively and with lower capex and opex. And again, I want to use here data from a market analyst. This is Signal AI. It's a different market analyst, very focused on the, uh, the, the WM market. And they've, uh, they've done some time ago an analysis where they compared two models that you see here on the top. On the top left, the traditional model of a router connecting to a transponder with client interfaces that hosts the line interface, the WM line interface connects to the line system. And at the top right, you see the new model, a router switch with the coherent WM interface that connects directly to the line system. And on the bottom, you see their, compa their uh, comparison of the, the, the CapEx. Um, now, don't focus too much on the actual values there. That's their choice. Um, I explicitly didn't hide the values or anything like that. Uh, that's not a statement from, from me or from Juniper that those values are always correct, right? They are heavily influenced by the, uh, the volume you buy this stuff at. If you're a cloud vendor and you buy this in the tens of thousands, then it's obviously different if you're an SP or an enterprise and you buy it in the hundreds. Um, so don't get too fixed on the values. Uh, but look at the, the, the relative differences between the, the, the gray, or, no, let's say yellow bar, the, the first one, and compare that to the red and dark blue bars, which are the ZR and ZR plus optics. And you immediately see there is an enormous difference, right? It's half the capex, maybe even one third of the capex uh, by going from the traditional model to the IP optical integration. And this is actually what we see happening, right? Uh, this, this prediction was pretty accurate. Uh, if you look at the, the kind of price levels that are there for ZR Plus, ZR, ZR Optics in the industry right now, there is simply no way an external transponder can even get close to it. So in that sense, it really is a very successful build-out of a broad ecosystem that's really changing things in the industry. Uh, another prediction here from market analyst, again back to light counting, where they plotted out over a number of years how they see the adoption of coherent interfaces. The blue bars here are the co what they call coherent onboard, which are the traditional WM transponders. And then there is the, the red bars are the coherent pluggables. These only refer to the 400 gig coherent pluggables. The green bars is anything what they call next generation, which is a mix of 800 gig and above transponders as well as pluggables. 
they said, okay, this is too early, we can't split up, we don't know how these, will, these two categories will divide. So just focus on the blue and the red bar here. And what you see is the blue bar is oh, kind of flat right, it's slowly increasing, but it's, there's not so much change and not so much growth in that area. Compare that to the red bar, which is obviously growing well, almost exponential. Uh, so definitely this is a very exciting market and uh, where things are really going to change a lot in the next few years. So what is the difference, right? Let's take step one step back, look a little bit more at the technology. What is the difference between 400 CR and OpenCR Plus? Because I'm not sure all of you are, are, are uh, really down into the, the details of this. 400 CR is focused on data center interconnects. It is 400 gig on the line side only, and it multiplexes 400 gig Ethernet or 4 times 100 gig Ethernet as client interfaces. It was really optimized for lowest possible power consumption. So all the choices in the specification were made such that we could build for the lowest possible power consumption that you can build a 400 gig coherent WM optic in. So it uses uh, what's called a CFAC code that is a relatively, it's an okay code, but not the super highest performance. Again, optimized for lowest possible power consumption. The distance is limited to about 120 kilometers, generally limited by the chromatic dispersion tolerance. So the, uh, the complexity of the equalizers in the DSPs is on purpose limited, again, to limit power consumption. And the original goal of the specification was to build these optics in a 15 watt power envelope. That didn't really work out completely. Most of the optics in the industry are about 16 to 17 watts, but we got pretty close. And 16 to 17 watts, right, this was uh, this, this, this target and, and, and this specification was well known for by everybody building the systems. So on almost all systems, you can readily support these type of optics. Now, OpenCR Plus is a little bit newer, right? As soon as 400CR was there, people saw that this was realistic, real, that it, uh, it really was going to change things in the industry. Everybody started to think, okay, so we have 400CR, let's do other things with this. Let's build coherent pluggables for other applications. And that quickly got referred to as ZR Plus. And for some time, ZR Plus meant many, many different things. It still sometimes means different things, but OpenZR Plus restricted that to a certain, a certain standard, right? Certain group of modes to again have interoperability across a wider set of use cases. Now not only focus on DCI, but metro, regional, and in some cases even long haul uh, transmission. So OpenZR Plus does has different line rate modes, 100 gig, 200 gig, 300 gig, 400 gig, and of course multiplexes uh, 400 gig Ethernet or n times 100 gig Ethernet client in order to, uh, to, to match the, the line rates. It adopts a much stronger forward air correction code called the OFAC code, which is now also broadly used in other standards, uh, which is pretty much up to par with the, the high end. Uh, forward air correction codes on WM transceivers, with the exception that it's just 15% overhead. WM transponders typically use a much higher overhead, and of course that gives also additional performance. Uh, and these optics are generally built for maximum reach, right? So they are limited by the OSNR tolerance of your line system, no longer by chromatic dispersion or any other uh, any other limitations built into the optic itself. As a result, it's a bit of a balance between power and performance. They are Higher power, 20 watts plus, right? 20 to up to about 23 watts, depending on the mode, depending on the functionality that is uh, that is used on these optics. Um, the OEF has standardized for 400 ZR. Uh, OpenRodem has standardized a lot of the properties that are used in OpenZR Plus. So the OpenZR Plus MSA is a bit of a combination between the OEF standard and some of the things used for OpenRodem. So as I mentioned, there are, there's a big range of different uh, vendors that are, uh, that are using this, that have been uh, or planning this, using it, building it. This is a picture taken from the OER, uh, sorry, from the, uh, the OFC last week, where you see an, uh, a Juniper MX304 router with uh, 400ZR optics from 12 vendors plugged in. Uh, you see here also on the right the different, uh, different logos. So it's a very nice representation of system vendors, optical vendors, some component vendors. Uh, I, and given the fact that five, six years ago, when we started down this road of standardization, quite a lot of po people in the industry didn't even believe this was possible, uh, I think this is really an amazing result. 
And it's now really starting to, do, to be deployed, right? And deployed at large scale. Here you see some data from Microsoft. Microsoft has been the first mover in this industry. They, uh, they deploy a lot of these optics and they are a little bit public about it. So they actually published some of the results. I'm sure some of the other cloud scalers are also deploying this already, but maybe they're a little bit uh, less talkative about it. Uh, so this is some, uh, some field data uh, I got from Microsoft looking at uh, what they have uh, done initially in the first few months of deployment. So this was about over 700 deployed, mo uh, deployed modules. Uh, and there already, this was an enormous success in terms of how easy it was to, to start to deploy this, how easy it was uh, to, 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 yeah, to, to bring up these systems. Microsoft in the prior generation was using 100 gig WM uh, direct attack modules called the Color Z modules, which are a lot and a lot more difficult to use. So for them, moving from direct attack technology to coherent technology was an enormous step forward in simplicity, even though at the same time they moved it, they changed from 100 gig to 400 gig on the data rate. Um, then uh, very briefly on where we are changing in terms of the technology inside the optics so that we go to the higher transmitter output powers, right? On the, the model you see here on the left is the traditional ZR, ZR Plus optic with the DSP, the laser, and then typically silicon, silicon photonics integrated optical circuit. And this arrived, then we get this minus 10 dBm transmitter output power. This was specified as part of the 400 ZR and OpenZR Plus specifications to allow these optics to be built both in indium phosphide and silicon photonics. Silicon photonics is not a great material if you want a high transmitter output power, simply because you have high coupling losses, right? The laser is always external. You cannot build a laser in silicon photonics. And because of the coupling losses inside and outside, or in and out of the, uh, the optical peak, uh, you get a low transmitter output power. Now, that doesn't matter for DCI applications. Uh, it also doesn't really matter for greenfield applications, greenfield rodent designs, but it does matter a lot in brownfield applications for the rodents that have typically been deployed over the last years. Now, how do we deal with this? We need to have pluggable modules with higher transmitter output power. There are two ways of doing this. You can integrate a micro EDFA, uh, either with or without a tunable filter. An EDFA, of course, has out-of-band noise, uh, which you need to filter out, for example, on colorless rodents. Uh, if you have fixed airdrop rodents, maybe you do not. Uh, but both, mo both of these are options readily available in the industry, or you can build it based on the indium phosphide pick. Indium phosphide allows you to integrate the laser, so it allows you to build higher transmitter output modules. Both of these approaches are now starting to become available in the industry. It's, that's really happening right now, right, over the last few uh, prototypes in the last year, now starting to go towards production. So in both of these categories, you see now multiple vendors uh, that, that start to have these, uh, these optics available. And we will see a lot more of this happening in the next, uh, next few months. Then, as promised, also we go towards 800 gig, 800 gig coherent, initially for DCI applications, the 800 ZR specification. All of the technology choices have been made on this, right? The standard is now being in an approval state, so almost finalized. Effectively, the important thing here is 400 ZR and 800 ZR are almost identical. The ID with 800 ZR is I can take out an, a 400 ZR module and basically replace it with an 800 ZR model. It will close exactly the same link. The only difference is I need a wide enough channel spacing. I need at least 150 gigahertz channel spacing simply because we go to twice the baud rate. But if you deploy a 400 ZR optic on an 80 kilometer link or on 120 kilometer link, the idea is that 800 ZR will do exactly, will close exactly the same link. So. We need 800 ZR because once we have 800 gig ports on our systems, we obviously don't want to strand half the bandwidth. And of course, long term also, a single 800 ZR module will be more cost effective than two separate 400 ZR modules. Right? But it does not allow for higher capacity. It doesn't allow for higher reach. It's really addressing the same use case. And then finally, to close off uh, for, for today, I want to give you some examples from an, uh, a trial that we did a few months back on, uh, on OpenZR Plus here in uh, close by here, right, on the SUNET network. So here you see some examples. This was du using Juniper PTX routers uh, on the, uh, the national backbone of SUNET. So it's a nice thing. It's, it's, uh, they have some, some very large links, so it allowed us to, to do some, uh, some interesting things, really put this uh, to the test on a live network. And you see here in a 400 gig mode, up to 600 kilometers, uh, 300 gig mode, 900,000 kilometers, even with significant margin. And in a 200 gig mode, even the relatively large SUNET network was not large enough to find paths uh, that, uh, that we could really max out the performance. So it really shows that 400 gig coherent pluggables can be used in metro, regional, and normal networks. 
And even that, you can do other things with it, because if you take the telemetry readings of these optics and you correlate this with the local weather forecast, you can see you can actually predict the weather with the telemetry readings of a coherent pluggable. And with that, on a little bit lighter note, thanks for, for listening. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, if you have any questions, either ask it now, come to me during the lunch, or after lunch, I'll be here for the rest of the day. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Dirk right now? Okay. Hey, Frederick, Amazon Web Services, currently also deploying for GigSidr in the tens of thousands. Uh, so one comment and one question. So first, uh, thanks for coming and having this presentation. This is, uh, I think, the best optical presentation that you can ever have uh, every year. So, so thanks for that. Uh, secondly, so you spoke about the, the health of the ecosystem uh, around 400 gig set R. Uh, do you feel there's any difference in the ecosystem and the health of the ecosystem for set R plus uh, in terms of um, available components and ODMs that actually build these optics or uh, like from a personal point of view, is it the same? Um, I think it's largely the same um, because if you look at the 400 ZR optics, uh, the majority of the uh, suppliers there are building using uh, the, the Marvel DSP, which is very broadly available in the industry, and the same DSP also supports the OpenZR Plus uh, modes. Um, a big difference is the OES, OEF has been driving plug fests for 400 ZR. You saw one of the examples on, on the picture, and that really allows a very public proof point that so many uh, different vendors are interoperating with each other, and that is all according to specifications. At the moment, there's no real organization driving in the industry this kind of plug fest for OpenZR+. Plus. Um, we're actually, this, this week, we are doing some interop at the ENTC in Berlin. Uh, ENTC is, of course, typically very packet-focused, but they have also now kind of adopted uh, ZR+, Plus as, as test cases, so we are doing some interops there. But, of course, it's with a relatively limited number of, of suppliers uh, so far. So the best thing that can happen for OpenZR+, Plus would be that there is a plug fest type of style event being organized so to really show to the industry that this is working. Uh, but since this also involves more regional long-haul links, it is, of course, a little bit more complex. You need a lot more equipment to do something like that. Thank you very much. Um, and to add to that for the PlugFest, it's not only the line side you need to make sure that it's standardized. You need the electrical interface, the i 2 square to c interface, and all the registries and so on. So that, that you have 15 vendors, you don't have to do 15 different, uh, you know, implement 15 different ways of controlling this thing, setting the frequency and getting information out of it. So that's one of my pet peeves that I've seen still lacking. So, but when I come and say, oh, I want to, I want to buy from this new, uh, this vendor, you say, oh, we need to do software development to support it. That shouldn't happen. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's of course, uh that would require much more than the allocated time to, to go into details on that. Um, mm -hmm. That very nice picture you showed was, of course, more than a, a week of an engineer, multiple engineers, getting to work to, to make that picture a reality. Uh, if you deploy it in all of the varieties that you have on, on actual deployed systems, it's not that easy. I fully agree. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Dirk. Thanks. And yeah, enjoy the lunch. <laughs>